You're listening to the Team Guru Podcast, bringing to life the theory and principles of leadership. Capitalism, is it on the brink of significant change? Is there a new horizon coming into view? Hello and welcome to the Team Guru Podcast. My name's David Frizzell, and in this episode 75, I talk to Mike Edmonds about this powerful concept and what it will mean for the relationship between supplier and consumer. I quiz Mike on new capitalism. What is it? How will we know when it's arrived? And what will it mean for us? We talk about the concept of truth and purpose. What role has it played in our economy to date? How will that change and what kind of model will be operating? Mike is a veteran of the marketing world. He's seen capitalism up close, warts and all, for a long time. He's noticed the changes and is starting to form a very clear view of where it's all headed. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Mike Edmonds. Mike Edmonds, welcome to the Team Guru Podcast. Yeah, g'day. How you doing? Fantastic. Nice to have you on board, Mike. Now, your book, Truth, Growth, Repeat, you start with the concept. You put it in the context of capitalism and the new capitalism. You talk about the fact that truth or finding our, our true purpose will be really important in this new capitalism. I'm intrigued by that concept, and I'd like to start with that New capitalism, what is it, and how do we know when we've arrived? Well, effectively, new capitalism sounds a bit, you know, uh, scary. What it is really is just a simple theory that uh, if we live in a transparent world where every consumer, wherever they are on the planet, have the ability to share the true experience of brands instantly and globally, uh, then the era of exaggerating claims or uh, promising things that you know you can't really deliver as a company, they must be over, surely, because it's going to be a gigantic waste of money because um, people are going to share their disappointment and you're going to have to um, clean up the mess afterwards. So are we there yet? I mean, what you described there, the ability for us and, and, and the way you describe it in your book as well, the ability for us as consumers with a couple of strokes of the keyboard and a, and a couple of clicks we can share our experience with a supplier, positive or negative, to hundreds or thousands or millions of people across the world in an instant. It sounds like we're already there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we we are close. The thing about true purpose, though, is that people won't buy from a company simply because they're pursuing a true purpose or telling the truth. The power of true purpose is what happens when you authentically follow it. I think it's good that you tell the truth. And I think it's uh, becoming more and more important in business, but that's not an end in itself. The numbers of people who wanted to buy from honorable companies, uh, it's very small still, too small to really make a living depending on, on your category. So I believe that the power of true purpose until the world all rises up the uh, Maslow's pyramid to um, you know, self-actualization and, and can afford to buy only from ethical and honorable companies, yeah. Uh, until then, the, the, the power of purpose is the fact of what happens when you pursue it. And I can, I can tell you what that is if you want to hear. I'll try and keep it brief. No, absolutely. I, I want to hear all about true purpose. In fact, the, the, um, your, your circle, your virtuous circle that you describe in your book is, is obviously the nub of the issue. And, and I want to get to that really soon. But I just want to talk about this context that you set up really nicely in your book as well around this idea of the new capitalism. So before we get back to the, the true purpose, and I, and I know it's very much intertwined, I want to dwell on that a little and talk about the fact that obviously we will not wake up one day to this thing that we're calling new capitalism. It will happen like so many other things, slowly and gradually to the point where we describe it that way, and we look back at the 20th century at an, the old era of capitalism, and we understand that we've moved into a new era. I get that, and, and it's really interesting, if not exciting. 
I want to talk about though your experience. You've got an extensive 20 year career experience in marketing. If we're talking about truth playing such an important role in new capitalism, what kind of role has truth played in the lead up to that? In the old capitalism, as you've defined it over the 20th century, we talk about lack of truth was in your experience as a marketer, was the lack of truth that characterized some era of capitalism, was it overt and deliberate that you've experienced or was it kind of that mild, habitual falling in line with the commercial norms? Yeah, look, I've been actually working in marketing for 40 years. Um, oh, I under, undersold you there, Mike. My apologies. <laughs> yeah, no, 1978, actually, I, I began. But um, yeah, look, I don't think there are many companies out there, many CEOs and management teams who are genuinely evil people and who are greedy horrible, you know, capitalist monsters. Yeah. I think what has happened and what I've observed is that everybody falls into a kind of um, tradition, a kind of business convention, and mm. it goes like this. It goes, it doesn't matter what we think and it doesn't matter what we, uh, what our passions are and our own human emotions. What really matters is what the customer wants. Yeah. So what we'll yeah. do is we'll go out and we'll research what the customer wants and then we'll tell all our staff that that's what we now need to focus on and that's who we yeah. are. And in the book, I share a lot of examples of that. But, you know, one, one of the classic ones was standing in front of a, an auditorium of a very large service company and telling them all that as of 8 a.m. tomorrow, you now You're need happy. to be happy. You need to be the happy insurance <laughs> company because we've done a lot of expensive research and we've found out that that's what the customer wants. And um, mm. despite the fact that we have been growing this business for decades, uh, not on the basis of making you happy, but on the basis of making our shareholders happy, yeah, you kind of got to fake it. And that's yeah. the kind of uh, untruth that I've been absolutely uh, dealing with my whole career. Companies come to my company and say, hey, we've got a pretty average product. Our service is variable. Our service quality is variable depending on uh, you know whether people wake up on the right side of the bed each morning. So can you make us look good? Can you make us appealing? Can you give us a brand image? Wow, that would really come to you and say that. That's so honestly, we're not very good. Our product's pretty dodgy. We want you to make us look good. I mean, I guess from a client perspective, you want them to be honest, right? Yep, that makes sense. But wow, that, that kind of blows me away a little bit that you would have that kind of a brief. Yeah, but you know what? This never comes out in those those words, right? It, that, that's me paraphrasing after you know hundreds and hundreds of conversations where that has been basically what's going on. The reason why it doesn't ever strike people as being as stupidly overt as that is because it comes out in all sorts of um, business and marketing gobbledygook, you know, like our, our strategic pathway to the future and uh, our three horizon plan for growth and market making. That's how it's said. Mm. And there's this assumption that if we don't, you know, mirror back to consumers what they want, how they look, how they live, what their values are, then they won't like us. And, you know, my, my point to business is, is um, stop trying to be liked and think about what it's going to take to be respected because throughout the history of commerce, it's the brands who stand for something and want to be respected for a point of view who are the ones that really grow and, and thrive and make new markets and reinvent the whole idea of uh, free enterprise. You talk about that famous story in your book, uh, the, the Model T Ford, Henry Ford saying, well, if I asked my customer what they wanted, they'd say a faster horse. So he was thinking not about what the customer wants now, but but what he can deliver that adds greater value. And 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 you talked about the fact that he had a very good sense of purpose. So as we move towards this, I mean, is there a risk, Mike, when we talk about this lovely picture of the new capitalism where truth is at the center of our communication between supplier and manufacturer and the consumer, that organizations, individuals, and leaders have found their true purpose and we're trading on that. Is there a risk that that's a, a kind of optimistically naive faith that truth will win the day? Or is it just as likely as we evolve into this new capitalism and begin a new era and change is inevitable? Is there just the continuing risk that that intersection of economic and political power will again flex its muscle to manipulate the market and, and in turn consumers and outmaneuver this movement of truth? Yeah, look, um, in the book, I make it very clear that you can make a, a living by manipulating consumers' vulnerabilities, by finding out what it is that we're most scared of and 
by um, pretending to be something that you're not and uh, making up for the, the disappointed customers that, that leave you. You can just market your way out of it and attract new customers. You can make a living out of that and you can grow a company out of that, but it's not a very enjoyable life. At the end of the day, you've got to really ask yourself, why am I working? Why am I starting a business? Because if the answer is just to make money, then you know you're not you're going to have a hard you're going to have a hard run. So the because uh, I get asked all the time, well, if truth is so important, how come you know people still stay with the big banks? You know, because they're greedy and they lie to us, and they're the perfect example of exaggeration in marketing. And and I'm saying, well, look, that will always be the case, and I can't make up for you know human apathy. And uh, to be honest, a lot of us, well, most people stay with the big banks because those obscene profits they make subconsciously make us kind of um, pretty comfortable that they're going to be a safe place for our money. So uh, what I'm saying is, you know, companies that put money first and then pretend to be something to consumers that they're not really uh, in order to, to win their favour, you can do that. But uh, have a look at companies uh, like Apple or even my, one of my favourites, Patagonia, the outdoor clothing company that comes right out and says, we're not in this because the outdoor industry is booming and we've found a way to make money out of it. They are in it because they love the outdoors and they want people to enjoy it, so they want to give them the right gear and equipment to enjoy it, and they absolutely understand that if they stuff up the environment, then they will not have a business. So they're very honest about that to their consumers, to their customers, so much so to, that they say to their customer, and here's what's good about our clothing, like take a jacket, you know, a, a jacket that's supposed to survive in, in cold temperatures. And here's what's not so good about it. They tell them the good and the bad. And only honest companies do that. Only companies who are pursuing a genuine purpose and who feel confident in that are brave enough to say, you know what, I'm going to tell you the truth, folks. This is what we're doing really good and this is what we're not doing so good. But here's what we're doing about the bits we're not doing so good. We're trying this, we're trying that, and we'll let you know when we have any breakthroughs. That is becoming incredibly profitable. And this is the thing about the book, and this is why it's called Truth, Growth, Repeat, because there's a system, there's an approach that you can learn, there's a pattern that has a win-win. You can do what you love and make money. And in fact, the more the, the, the world becomes transparent, the more that we can communicate with each other, the more savvy the consumer gets about how marketing works and how, how capitalism works, the more this effect is going to take place. So it's a confluence of a number of factors. It's not just a simple case of, hey, it's better to tell the truth. Truth will make you more money. It's not as simple as that. What it is is if you truly believe that you are doing something that's meeting an unmet need or is, is a valuable thing or creating value in an industry where there's no value now or providing even a better service for people who are being underserved, if you truly believe that, you will attract people onto your staff who will want what you want and together you'll create amazing things. You'll innovate and you'll come up with service and product you know, innovations that will create market viability. So your passion is going to become more commercially viable in this new capitalist world than the old convention of just pretending to um, want what consumers want. Whether it's a half-day energizer session or a comprehensive team and leadership program, Team Guru's unique approach could be just what the doctor ordered for your organization. You talked about it being a confluence of factors there, and, and earlier you mentioned Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's, it's almost as if the old capitalism has bred itself to the point where a new capitalism is inevitable because a lot of people give capitalism, the economic system, uh, the credit for lifting the standard of living right across the world. And as people move up Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and, and let's face it, those of us who are lucky enough to live in the richest countries around the world most of us are, are not worried about putting food on the table. Most of us have got that covered. Most of us have even got even better things covered, like being able to buy clothes and gadgets and all that kind of stuff. So the further we move up Maslow to, towards self-actualization, the more as consumers, we can be conscious of the moral and ethical standards of the companies that we deal with. Does that make sense? Is that a fairly decent read on the on the way that capitalism has progressed to this point, it's it's created this situation itself. Yeah, I think it's it's that's what is the destiny of capitalism, and I think that's definitely where it's headed. But it's not there now. The numbers just don't stack up. And I'm a real streetwise, you know, realist. My background is creative director, copywriter, 
my job for 40 years has been to be the the person who stands between the company and the consumer. I'm like an interpreter. Mm. Like uh, imagine two alien races coming to a, to a table to negotiate and uh, neither can speak each other's language. I'm the guy that <laughs> translates for them, right? So I know, I know what the win-win is. And um, we're not there yet with just purely buy from ethical companies because it's the right thing to do. We're just too lazy, too selfish, too self-absorbed. Yeah, You know, like uh, I'll still dro- buy a can of Diet Coke if I'm really thirsty and there's nothing else. I'm with a big bank. These things prove to me, and, and there's a lot of research to back it up, that it's too soon to say to a small business owner, hey, go out there and only appeal to people who want to deal with honorable companies. You'll make a fortune. That's not the case, unfortunately. Yeah, One day, maybe, one day, like gender equality and so forth. We're not there yet as a human race. However, there is a brilliant upside to wanting to pursue your own truth, your own authentic motive for being in business because of what that leads to. And what that leads to, if you genuinely pursue it, is a more competitive business. Like one of the titles I use in the book is The Monopoly of You. And it's a sense that if you understand the true motive you have for being in business and and, and your motive to improve something and to you know, fill a gap in the world. If you pursue that, then you will come up with better ways of serving the customer. And you'll do it so in a way that is so authentically you that no one can copy it. Yeah. You know, you it's a, a very easy world these days. You've got a monopoly, but a good monopoly, right? Because it's basically just a very unique offering. And, and all these knock-on effects of uh, once people sample your product or service and realize that there's a genuine, genuine value in there, not just over-promised value, but genuine value, they'll probably want to know a bit more about you. And when they hear that you've provided this value because you believe in it, it just opens a tiny little door of trust where there is no trust right now. In fact, you know, did you ever watch Get Smart as a kid? Yes. You know, at the end of Get Smart where all the doors closed in front of him? Yes. He's walking down a corridor and all these doors close, all these steel doors come down and slide across. I remember. Yeah, that's what the average consumer's level of defense is when it comes to trusting corporations, right? We just don't. We've learned not to trust them. So when when you meet a company that is pursuing a true purpose and they provide a, a product or a service to you and you sample that product or service and you go, holy crap, this is actually, not only is this actually pretty good, but it's actually what they said it would be. Yes, and then what happens yes. is this tiny little ray of sunlight comes through between the company and you. And it's incredibly powerful and incredibly commercially viable because that trust will keep them as a customer will give you confidence to do more and, and therefore you can develop and, and make be- things better and better. Uh, it's a, it's a lo- lovely image you paint of the transition that we're in and, and the future that's possible, Mike. Very positive indeed. You have, of course, put together a model all about true purpose and authentic motive. You do acknowledge that it's a, a virtuous circle, probably the most common type of model next to the quadrants but it's a powerful model and there are there are five points on it. I wonder if you could talk us through those five points, how we go about finding our true purpose and, and making sure that we're working it for ourselves and just as importantly for the consumers that we serve. Yeah, absolutely. This, um, this circle of true purpose is, is a very simple pattern that you can learn and apply to your, your life and your business. It's either a virtuous circle or a vicious circle, depending on which way you go around it. The correct way is to begin with true purpose and is to begin by understanding what is your authentic motive for being in business. I haven't met a business owner yet who, once they've got past the, oh, I want to be my own boss and I want to make money and I'm tired of working for for dickheads. And once they get past those things, the more you devil it, eventually arrive at a passion, an anger about something or a frustration. And uh, this is what I do in workshops. And it's kind of, you got to get to that point where, People are angry about something because they're, you know, uh, one of my favorite clients I worked on was an internet company and the guy was angry that the telephone companies had inherited the internet that was just given to them because it was like telecoms. It's like, okay, well, you you guys, the phone companies can sell the internet. He hated that because he didn't think they understood the true power of this incredible invention. So he made his own. He's now the second biggest in the country and it's a whole other story, but we're working with him, there was a tangible anger that he wasn't just saying, I want to be in business to make money and, and grow my personal wealth and, and become you know, successful. Of course, those things were there. But underlying it was this anger that he felt that people were being underserved and deceived by these stupid old phone companies. 
And what we said to him was, wow, that, let's bottle that. Let's enunciate that. And let's put that on the boardroom wall and behind the reception wall because that's way more powerful than any kind of um, fake made-up vision, mission, you know, set of values crap that we see all the time in, in corporate companies. So we helped enunciate that. And what happens when you when you got something like that is that it will attract – Again, I haven't met a company yet where once they enunciate their true purpose, the, the next point on the circle is, is attraction. And the attraction is who at the moment coming out of school and universities, these smart millennials, these digital natives, these creative people who are going to build the future, the best of those, who do, who do they want to work for? I'll give you an example. Um, it's a common example, but it's one everyone can relate to, Apple, Apple computers. Even like back in the late 90s when the, the board of Apple were, were just trying to convince Steve Jobs that their future was making more computers and he fell out with them because he said, no, that's not our purpose. Our, not, our purpose isn't to make computers. Our purpose is to harness emerging technologies to help mankind advance. Wow, yeah. Who do you think coming out of MIT and Caltech, these smart you know, next generation of you know, business wonder kids, which company do they want to work for? Which ones do you think they're going to be attracted to? Someone that says, hey, we want you to come and make computers over and over and over and every three years just tweak them a little bit. <laughs> or, hey, we want you to come to this, this company and I want to help you unleash the commercial and societal value that's inside your head right now about cool shit, about technology, about creativity and connectivity and communication and expression. Which company do you think they're going to go to? And then when that when they all rush over to the, to the visionary purpose driven company, what do you think is going to happen? The third point on the circle is what happens then is you get genuine innovation. You get new products and new service design that comes from an authentic motive, and it is brand new. Like I was talking about with the monopoly of you, it's brand new and it's different because it's your view of what should be. You see, when companies research what the customer wants, they all end up looking the same because mm. they all get the same answers. Yeah, You know, I've managed to work in a, a reasonably small regional market my whole career, a population of 2 million people in, in my home city. And so what happens over the decades is you get the same clients coming in and out and you get and you get to work not only with one health insurer but all of them in the market over the time. Right. And, and so I, I've seen right at the coalface of capitalism the, the conventional way of just, you know, going out and asking people what they want. You end up with the same answers. Mm. So the third point on the, on the circle is innovation. And when you innovate genuinely because your tribe is engaged in the vision that you've set them through your true purpose, then you grow. And you not only grow in sales, you grow in customer retention, you grow, you grow your industry, your industry gets better because you are getting better, you're pushing it forward. You grow, excuse me, obviously you attract the eye of other companies want to get into bed with you, companies want to buy you. You become, you get this sort of sense of being a, the it company. And I've seen it time and time again. I'm seeing it now for a couple of companies that we've just helped, you know, enunciate their true purpose. So the fourth point is grow. And then, of course, the fifth and last point is reward. And this is perhaps one of the biggest chapters in the book because it has to unpick what people think the reward of business is. And it's way beyond returns to shareholders, you know, BMW in the car park, dividends and, and obscene CEO bonuses. You can get all that. I'm not saying that's, that's you know, out of the question. It's just that's not the only thing you get. What you get is an incredible culture. Your staff feel a part of something. So the culture is you don't have to fake it, you don't have to force it. It becomes this incredible, you get this incredible momentum of positivity and confidence that you're achieving something and denting the universe. Those people go home and they're happy at night. They don't kick the cat and uh, show their kids that working for a living sucks and it makes you tired and stressed. So, you know, I believe purpose driven companies who go around the circle in this way are helping to teach the next generation who are currently children, that, you know, what this thing called working for a living, a living in capitalism is, is a good thing and you can enjoy yourself and you can get fulfilled from it and make money. And I, so I detail a lot of other rewards that come from this. And they're, they're the basic five points on the circle. And, of course, the next, you know, conversation is about what happens when you go around several times yes. or, and also what happens when you go the wrong way. And that's where I want to go. Mike, you've just explained that beautifully. I just let you run there without asking any questions because you were on a roll and it just makes so much sense the way you talk around the circle like that. Just to recap for the listeners, we, we start with true purpose where we're searching for our authentic motive. And you, you talked about the fact that, um, for example, the, the internet guy was angry that the phone companies just inherited by default the internet. And they didn't know what they had. They didn't appreciate the power of the tool they had. 
You also told a really nice little story in your book about a mechanic who was working for a major service provider. And because of KPIs and, and everything else that we're all familiar with, he and his fellow mechanics were limited to, they were time bound on everything that they did. So if they were doing a brake change for you, they had a certain amount of time to do it no matter what. And it just hit, hit home on him one day when he was watching a mum and her kids climb into the car after he'd serviced it. And he just didn't feel confident that he'd done a great job because he had to do it in a certain amount of time. He'd changed her brakes and couldn't be sure she was driving, driving off in a completely safe car. And that's what motivated him. So that hunt for the true purpose. I might add there, Mike, a couple of the stories that you've got come from the negative, that concept of, hey, the internet is owned by the, the phone companies by default. That annoys me. Or that anger the mechanic had as he watched that woman drive off in a car he couldn't be sure was safe. That's what motivated him. But it's powerful stuff, that negative motivation. Is it always that way? Is it always a negative motivation, a reaction to what already exists, a reaction to the status quo? No, no. Sometimes it can be something that you believe a very, very positive thing that you believe the world needs. But I have a personal belief. When I've done this exercise many, many times with um, small business owners and, and, in fact, large business owners, owners uh, and boards of billion-dollar ASX-listed companies. And um, eventually, if you can couch what you want to achieve, even if it's a positive thing, even if it's something like, um, oh, I want to help mothers you know, feel good about themselves and not feel the guilt, and so I want to have a website that, that gives them tips and la la. That's good. But my my uh, observation is unless you can also understand what's potentially at stake if you don't do it, you know, for example, using that example saying, well, you know, if I don't do this, then mothers are going to continue to be, you know, um, upset with themselves and they're going to they're gonna maybe be bad role models for their kids because they're so laden with guilt and they're going to make mistakes and they're not going to be truly themselves, whatever it is. I actually believe when the going gets tough as a business owner and you are thinking about ditching your true purpose and just going for the money, that anger or that, that the frustration or anger or sadness about, you know, what will happen if I don't do this is a more powerful motivator than the positive. That's the only thing I believe. Hmm. I've got nothing against optimism. I'm an optimist myself, but I've seen that optimism is not as powerful a force and doesn't make you as resilient as you know, getting angry about something. And I think throughout history, you've seen that even though, you know, Gandhi and uh, some of these rebel armies that have eventually taken over corrupt governments and, you know, won the day, uh, they've all had their positive version of why they're doing it, but they've all laid in bed at night thinking, if I don't do this, then, then something bad is going to happen or continue to, to be. And I think that's a much more powerful driver and you'll need that because following a true purpose and going against you know, conventional business. Convention. Hmm. It, yeah, it takes a lot of resilience and, and you have to be able to take it on the chin and you have to be able to get up and, and fight. And I, so I think a, an analogy where you're fighting for something rather than just walking proudly through, you know, through the gates of heaven, you know, well, with this purely optimistic view, I think it's a more powerful driver to make a difference in the world, not just to say something and then you go out and it's all too hard, so you back off. The people I've seen in business, the entrepreneurs and the creative thinkers who have achieved stuff, and probably in any walk of life throughout humanity, have been the ones who have been angry. <laughs> yeah. So even if you're not angry about something, find it, because I guarantee you that will be your, a better fuel for you than just pure optimism and, and uh, you know, positive attitude. That's good, honest advice, Mike. Do you want team and leadership development programs that actually work? Contact Team Guru today so we can start the conversation. I was talking through the circle. I'm not going to elaborate because you did such a brilliant job the first way, the first time around. I'm just going to remind the listeners of the five points. True purpose, that's your authentic motive. The attraction, attraction is next. You will attract fantastic employees. You, you will uh, attract the right type of clients. You will attract attention. You will create a following. And that will lead to innovation. If you've got great people coming to work for you because they believe in what your purpose is, they will innovate, they'll create new stuff, they'll create cool stuff. Just like the example you gave of Steve Jobs. And by the way, I liked your title of that chapter. Oh no, he's not going to talk about Steve Jobs, is he? Because it is a tired cliche, but it's for a reason, right? The guy really did make a dent in the universe as he set out to do. True purpose, attraction, innovation, growth, and reward. And I love the warning that you give. 
your circle is set up so you go around anti-clockwise, counterclockwise. But of course, the old business model just goes clockwise and it only knows two points on your circle. They think about purpose, which is to make money, and they go straight to reward and they try and make money. That's the the extent of the old paradigm, I guess. Yeah, and look again. I state I'm not. I'm not saying that's uh, you're a bad person if you do that. I'm just laying out what I see as the uh, ramifications of doing that, and they are growing and growing all the time. And the, the the ramifications are that if you are obsessed with the money first mantra, if money is your goal and, and the quarterly results and returns to shareholders, it just forces you into a fake relationship with consumers. It, it forces you straight away to give up what you genuinely believe and worse, what your incredibly talented staff who, who could, you know, have got so much potential to change the world, it puts that to one side and it says, I'm not interested in that. I'm only interested in what other people want. And it starts you down a road of um, deception and fakery. And that's why we end up with, you know, watching TV every night and having so many crappy TV ads sucking up to us. All right. Now, last word, Mike. Someone is listening to this right now. They love what you're saying. They've bought into it. It makes perfect sense. They want to be part of new capitalism, but they've got a mortgage to pay. They've got a small business to run. They want clients to keep coming through the door and their clients want to be told a certain thing. What do you say to people who want to buy into what you're saying, but they can't afford to do it? Yeah, look, that's a big question. There's a couple of strategies shared in the book. The ideal way is to say, right, if this resonates with you and, you, and and I only say that because I'm not trying to sell people on an idea, when they read the book and when they hear me speak, if it doesn't resonate, if the light doesn't go on behind their eye, then there's nothing I can do. But what I've found is with most people, a little light goes on in their eye and they go, holy crap, that's what I've been thinking about myself and yes, damn it, it's time I did Searching this. for. Yeah, and, and, and you're right, we have to do this. I say, well, if you can... You know, just dedicate yourself, go full strength, start your company, and you will meet clients that just goes over their head. They don't understand what you mean. And in our first year at my company, Meerkats, we we met clients who said, uh, you know, okay, clients would go, hey, buddy, I'll stop you right there. All that truth and stuff, uh, I'm not interested. I'll just tell you, I just want some ads every Saturday to flog my lights. And you kind of got a, got a decision to make, right? So you either decide, well, they're not going to allow us to fulfill our true purpose, but they're nice people. They'll pay on time. I can do that while I'm trying to change other people's opinions. There's nothing wrong with that, right? It's a parallel strategy. But you just got to be really careful that you don't let the um, just this once determine your whole company. I've met a lot of business owners who say, yeah, I started like that and now I am so far down the rabbit hole of doing what I don't love. I'm not, I'm not enjoying it. I'm a million miles away from doing what I really want to do. So you've got to be careful that if you if you don't you know if you if you do have to uh, if you're in an industry where this um, you know authentic delivery of value is not resonating and particularly happens in a lot of service companies then you've got a decision to make about whether you, it is possible to have a parallel strategy of pursuing your true purpose while at the same time working with you know clients who want conventional products and, and service from you. And in the book, I did I do mention some strategies in that case, and uh, in particular one we applied here right from the day one was called plus one. So we got nothing against working with a conventional client who doesn't want full strength, truth and honesty. But with every client, we'll just try and take them to the next level. You know, we'll just try and take them one level up towards what we think is the ideal. And so, therefore, you make money, you can you can start growing your business, but you feel like you are still working to change you're still you're still pursuing your true purpose and the more successful you are the more brave you can you can become about saying you can get about saying no to clients and about saying look we've taken you one step up it's time to take another step up otherwise we can't work together and we've we've resigned clients who um who've said no we don't we don't want to do that and you know that's what you have to be prepared to do but yeah, you know, look at your business model, <laughs> because uh, like I say in the, the start of the book, you know, this book is not about how to run a business, you know, with tax law and uh, profit projections and all that sort of stuff. It's about why would you run a business? Why go through all that hassle? What, what's at the end of the road? Mike Edmonds, it's very sage advice. I, I love your model. I love the concept of true purpose, and you speak about it really, really nicely, mate. Thank you so much for coming on the Team Guru podcast. Hey, no worry. Thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate a uh, very intelligent question asking and you've obviously, you know, done, done a lot of research and I appreciate that because 
this is grey area. You know, it's not black and white. It is it is quite nuanced. So telling stories and 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 having context is is really helps people understand. So I appreciate your interview being that deep. Oh, good on you, Mike. Thanks. And that was Mike Edmonds. I loved his optimistic view of where this is all heading. An economy in which information flows so quickly and easily, the dishonest don't survive. It's rather utopian, but completely logical at the same time. We live in an increasingly wealthy world where, more and more, consumers will have the resources to choose who they do business with on higher order issues like values and ethics. Organisations that are shooting for their true, authentic purpose will, according to Mike, win the day. His model to develop and capitalise on our true purpose is simple and convincing. Find your authentic motive, the thing that drives you. Often, it's something that gets you angry or scared. This will lead to attraction, attracting the best talent. Find your authentic motive, the thing that drives you. Often, it's something that gets you angry or scared. This will lead to attraction, the best talent, the right customers. They'll be drawn to you and innovation will follow. So will growth and eventually reward. And mixed with Mike's optimism is a wisdom grounded in reality. We are not at this utopian version of capitalism yet, but we're getting there. And the companies and leaders who get on board first will show us the way. As always, I'll share the lessons I took from my conversation with Mike on the Lessons Learned page for this podcast. You'll find it on the Team Guru website. That's teams with an S dot guru slash podcast. Connect with me on Twitter, Facebook, SoundCloud, or LinkedIn, and join me for the next episode on this, my mission to bring to life the principles and theory of leadership. This is David Frizzell for Team Guru. Bye for now. <laughs>